Hi everybody, Tradable Pollution Permits, also known as cap and trade is a very innovative policy aimed at battling pollution-based market failure. Innovative because there are elements of regulation in this policy, but really it's much more of a market-friendly approach to bringing down pollution. In that sense, overcoming some of the major issues of blanket regulation, we learned that blanket regulation, blanket pollution caps, can burden some firms far more than others, as all firms need to find a way to bring down pollution, this policy can overcome that kind of an issue. There are many countries out there that have a scheme like this. The EU have it, South Korea have it, the UK has it. So it's quite common as a means to tackle climate change and bring down CO2 emissions. How does it work? Well, it starts with a bit of regulation. Governments out there will set a pollution cap, the amount of CO2 emissions that the economy is allowed to emit in a year. And we assume that the governments know what the externalities of pollution are. We assume they can value those correctly and thus they'll know the socially optimum level. So the pollution cap, in theory, will be set at the socially optimum level of pollution at Q star. Then the government issues permits to firms across the economy. Think of a permit as basically like a piece of paper equivalent to one tonne of CO2. So permits are issued to firms across the economy to match the cap exactly. In that sense, a market for permits is created. And here it is, you have the price of permits, the quantity of permits. This is basically the market for pollution. The supply curve in this market is going to be vertical, perfectly priced inelastic, and that is because the amount of permits is fixed to match the cap. It can't rise, it can't fall, even if price changes. And that supply is going to be at the socially optimum level of Q star. Our demand curve is normal, downward sloping. So where the two curves meet, you have the price of permits, P1 essentially the price of pollution. But the reason why this policy is so smart, so novel, is because at this point, firms have a choice to make. If they are emitting more tons of CO2 than they're allowed to emit and the permits they have, they now have a choice to make. With blanket regulation and pollution caps, there was no choice for firms to make. They had to just find a way to bring pollution down. But now, firms have a choice to make. And they're gonna decide based on whatever is cheaper for them. So option number one, Firms can invest in green technology. They can find ways of producing that's more climate friendly. Yep, if it's cheap enough to do that, that's what firms will do. But if that's too burdensome for some firms, for some industries, there is a second option, and that is now to buy up spare permits in the market. And as I said, firms will decide based on whatever is cheaper for them. Take an example here of two firms, firm A and firm B. Both firms are currently emitting 40 tons of CO2, giving a total of 80. Let's now say this scheme is introduced and the cap is set at 72 with each firm re receiving 36 permits. They're allowed to emit 36 tons of CO2 each. In response, let's say firm A brings down CO2 emissions to 32. A firm A continues emitting at 40. It should be clear to you what choice each firm has made. Look at firm A. They've clearly invested in green technology because they brought down their levels of CO2. And in fact, so successfully, they brought it down more than they needed to, to 32 tons instead of the cap, which is 36, the number of permits they have. Whereas firm B have continued to emit at 40 tons of CO2. So what have they done? They've clearly bought up spare permits, in this case, the four spare permits from firm A. But it doesn't matter that both firms have chosen very, very different things, different ways to react to this policy. The overall level of CO2 emissions is at the cap level of 72. Brilliant. So in that sense, look, the externality is always going to be internalized here. The polluter, in this case the firm, is paying for the cost to society, is paying for that externality, but they're paying in the most efficient way, the most cost-effective way, and that is their choice. That's why this policy is so brilliant, so much better than regulation. And with strict enforcement, pollution will come down towards a socially optimum level. Allocative efficiency will be hit, we get maximum welfare in the market. But even better is that this policy promotes incredible long-run incentives. The long-run incentive always for firms to invest in green technology, to choose option number one, which is really, I guess, what society would like firms to do. And the reason is because firms, if they're really successful, can profit from the sale of spare permits, absolutely. But also firms that invest in green tech will never be burdened when permit prices rise. And I've said when, not if. So permit prices always rise, maybe because there is a sudden rise in demand for them, pushing up the price in the market, but more likely 
as the years go by, what do governments do? They tighten the cap. They bring down the allowed level, level of pollution even further, reducing the number of permits in circulation, shifting the supply curve to the left from S1 to S2. And look what happens to the price of permit. It rises from P1 to P2. But if you're a firm that's invested in green technology, you're not bothered by that at all. You're not trying to buy spare permits in the market. In fact, you're looking at this thinking, great, I can now sell my spare permits at a higher price. I can make more profit, great. So not only does this policy promote a choice for firms, gives them the most cost-effective way of bringing down pollution, but it promotes great long-run incentives as well. However, no policy in economics is perfect. There are issues, let's consider those. The first issue is that of enforcement. Can enforcement be afforded, especially in developing countries, if they were to use a policy like this? If it can't be afforded, there is an enforcement, the policy won't work. At the same time, is there technology to accurately measure emissions? If any of that isn't there, firms simply won't follow the policy. We assume that governments have got perfect information, valuing externalities, knowing the social optimum. In truth, they don't. So the cap level is likely to be set too tight, too strict, there are unintended consequences of that, or too lax, the risk of government failure either way. There are unintended consequences, of course, because regardless of the choice that firms make, this policy will be increasing cost of production for firms. And if it's really, really strict, if it's tough, the cost of production increase is very drastic, firms could shut down. That's not intended. They could leave the country and simply pollute elsewhere. They'll move to countries where policies are more lax or they don't exist at all when it comes to battling climate change and reducing pollution. Then all we see are carbon leakages. CO2 emissions move from one part of the world to another part of the world. That's not intended. That's not going to do any good. Or what do firms do? They pass on these higher costs via higher prices to consumers. Burdening consumers could be inflationary. So the government has to be mindful of those. If they're very severe, those unintended consequences are risk of government failure. But I would argue this is the biggest issue. And it's not really an issue of the policy, it's more an issue of politics and politicians. And that is there needs to be international cooperation with a scheme like this. Many countries need to partake in this kind of a scheme. And that is because climate change, pollution, it's not a market failure limited to one or two countries. It's a global market failure. But getting international cooperation is unbelievably difficult. Evidence has proven that. Uh, many developing countries are not keen to sign this because a policy that increases cost of production for firms is one that will burden firms. And many of these developing countries who are industrializing don't want that cost burden. They don't think it's fair. They should take on that cost burden. Developed countries get annoyed about that kind of response, especially when developing countries themselves are some of the biggest global polluters. So often they won't sign in return. And some governments out there don't even believe in climate change. So they often won't sign. And the end result is that, you know, a few countries might go ahead and take on the brunt and other countries simply free ride off the contributions of countries that do sign up and do reduce uh, carbon emissions. Other countries just sit back and say, well, that will do for us without us having to bear any of the cost burden ourselves. So we need it. It's very difficult to get it. Again, not really a fault of the policy, more a fault of politics and politicians, but a fair enough concern that you can raise. So that, guys, covers everything you need to know for tradable pollution permits, a really interesting policy. Hopefully now you've understood it and you can write about it really well in an essay. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all in the next video. Thank mm -hmm. you.